This video is going to be about the metric tensor, which is probably one of the most important tensors you'll come across in physics and applied mathematics. Let's say that I had a curve gamma of t on the xy plane, which was described using the parametric equations for the coordinate x as x of t, and for the coordinate y represented by y of t. The parameter in this case is t. Suppose also that I wanted to use these parametric equations to determine the length of this curve. What I can do to do that is to zoom in on this curve and isolate an infinitesimally small line segment. I can then write the length of this line segment as ds, which is really the hypotenuse of a triangle with sides of length dx and dy. And then using the Pythagorean theorem, I can then write ds as the square root of dy squared plus dx squared. Since x and y are functions of t, I can write the differentials dx and dy in terms of the derivatives dx by dt and dy by dt, but I do have to multiply by a dt term in addition. I can then take out the dt from the square root to end up with the following expression for ds. So this is what ds looks like in rectangular coordinates, but what about polar coordinates? Well, I could draw the same zoomed in line segment, but now the sides of my triangle would be constructed according to polar coordinates. I'd have one side representing the component of this line segment in the theta direction, and the length of this component would be r d theta. This r d theta is technically an arc on the circle, so it wouldn't be a straight line, but for distances that are small enough like these, we can approximate it as a straight line. In addition to this r d theta, I would have another side representing the component of this line segment in the radial direction, whose length would be d r. The arc length element ds in this polar coordinate scenario would be given by the square root of dr squared plus r d theta whole squared. Again, if we assume that the polar curve is expressed in terms of parametric equations for r and theta with respect to the parameter t, we can write these differentials for dr and d theta in terms of t and end up with the following. We can then take out the dt outside the square root to finally obtain this equation for the arc length element in polar coordinates. So now I'm going to copy paste the equation for the arc length element in rectangular coordinates for comparison and I'll call these equations equations 1 and 2 respectively. Now we've derived the arc length equations for both rectangular and polar coordinates, but what if we had a curve expressed in a generalized n-dimensional coordinate system with the coordinates x super i, where i is the index of the coordinate that varies from 1 to n. In that case, we can write the arc length element ds following the general pattern from the equations in rectangular and polar coordinates. According to this pattern, there's usually a square root of something and a dt outside the square root. Inside the square root, we have the derivative of one coordinate x super i with respect to t times the derivative of another coordinate x super j with respect to t. In equations 1 and 2, we had the derivatives of the coordinates multiplying with themselves. So we had dx by dt times dx by dt, dr by dt times dr by dt, and this general expression allows that. You're allowed to multiply dx i by dt with itself, for instance, but since this is a more general expression, we're allowing for cross terms here. Now this expression is currently incomplete. We have to have something that allows us to sum over the product of these derivatives, and we have to have a coefficient term that, for instance, accounts for the fact that there might be an r squared multiplying one of the derivative terms, like there is for the arc length element and polar coordinates. This coefficient term I'm going to call g sub ij, and this g sub ij in fact represents the components of a tensor called the metric tensor, which is what this video and the video following this is going to be about. So at this point we have an expression for the arc length element in generalized coordinates consisting of the square root of a sum over the indices i and j of the metric tensor component g sub ij times the product of the two coordinate derivatives dx super i by dt and dx super j by dt. Note that this expression is a sum over indices because as discussed in our video on Einstein notation, if the index is repeated twice in a single term, that index is summed over i and j are repeated twice here in the g and in the derivative, so they are summed over. The final touch is to add in an absolute value because we don't want to turn the square root into a square root of a negative number. So the metric tensor in the end basically acts as a modifier for arc length or distance in different spaces or different coordinate systems. So if I have a curve and I want to calculate the length of that curve in different coordinate systems, I can use the metric tensor corresponding to that particular coordinate system to find the length of that curve. Even more intuitively, the metric tensor basically tells us the geometry of the coordinate system or the space that we're in. 
By geometry, I mean that the metric tensor can be used to determine angles on different surfaces or different coordinate systems. It can be used to determine distances in different coordinate systems or spaces, just like we showed here. And it can be used to determine the version of the Pythagorean theorem in those different spaces. The list goes on and on, but the idea I want you to take home is that the metric tensor tells us the geometric properties of different spaces. So now that we've given some intuition behind the metric tensor, let's give some examples of the metric tensor in different coordinate systems. Specifically, I'm going to focus on the three-dimensional Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical coordinate systems, the ones that we're all familiar with. We'll start with the Cartesian coordinates in three dimensions. So I'll draw a set of axes and I'll call my Cartesian coordinates x super 1, x super 2, and x super 3 in place of the usual x, y, and z. Suppose I have a three-dimensional curve gamma defined using these parametric equations of x super 1, x super 2, and x super 3 in terms of some parameter t. Suppose also that I want to find the arc length of my three-dimensional gamma by zooming in on an infinitesimally small segment ds. In this rectangular coordinate system, ds would be defined using the elements dx1, dx2, and dx3. And how do I find ds? Well, I can use the three-dimensional version of the Pythagorean theorem, where ds squared, my hypotenuse, is given by dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus dx3 squared. Don't confuse the superscript indices with the power here. The power will always be outside the parentheses in my tensor series. Now if I isolate ds, then I get the square root of everything on the right, which looks like this. If I now divide everything in the square root by dt squared and take the dt outside, which I'm allowed to do since dt on the outside divided by dt squared inside the square root basically means I'm multiplying by 1. If I do that, I get the following. Let's now compare this to my general equation involving the metric tensor, which I had up here. And the reason I want to do this comparison is that I want to do it to determine the components of my metric tensor g sub ij. And to facilitate this comparison, I'm going to take my distance element in Cartesian coordinates and expand it out as follows so it best resembles what I have in my more general formula. Note that in addition to the square terms, I've also included cross terms, but these cross terms have a coefficient of zero since they're not found in the actual expression for the Cartesian arc length element. So now if I make the comparison, I'll find that g sub 1, 1 is 1, g 1, 2 is 0, g 1, 3, g 2, 1 are also 0, g sub 2, 2 is 1, but then g sub 2, 3, g sub 3, 1, and g sub 3, 2 are all 0, and finally g sub 3, 3 is 1. So these are the components of my metric tensor in the three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. And if I put them together, I find that overall my metric tensor in Cartesian coordinates is given by this, which basically looks like the identity tensor. So for Cartesian coordinates, the metric tensor isn't that useful, it's just an identity tensor. However, it is a bit more unique and complicated for more curvilinear coordinate systems. And let's focus on one such curvilinear coordinate system in three dimensions, the cylindrical coordinate system. Cylindrical coordinates are just 3D versions of polar coordinates. I've got a radial coordinate x super 1, an angular coordinate x super 2, which tells me the angle relative to the positive x-axis, and another coordinate x super 3, which is basically my z-coordinate. Suppose again that I have a three-dimensional curve gamma defined using these parametric equations of x1, x2, and x3 in terms of some parameter t. Again, I can find the arc length of my 3D gamma by zooming in on an infinitesimally small segment ds. And in this cylindrical coordinate system, ds would be defined using the elements dx super 1, dx super 2, and dx super 3, which are oriented a bit differently from the corresponding elements in the Cartesian system. In any case, though, I can write ds using an expression very similar to the expression I had for polar coordinates earlier in the video, but now there's an additional dx super 3 squared because of the z coordinate. Again, I'll compare this to my general expression for the arc length element involving the metric tensor. Once again, the cross terms are zero, meaning I don't have the derivative of one coordinate multiplying the derivative of another coordinate in my expression for ds in the cylindrical coordinate system. All the derivatives that I have in this expression are squared, meaning they multiply themselves. And because of this, I can make things simple and write my metric tensor components for all the cross terms as zero. However, the metric tensor components g11, g22, and g33 are given by the following. Then if I put all of these components together, I find that my overall metric tensor in cylindrical coordinates is as follows.
And this leaves our next curvilinear coordinate system, spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, I have the distance coordinate x1, so not the radial distance along the xy plane like in cylindrical coordinates, but actual distance from the origin, complete distance from the origin. This x1 is basically analogous to the row that you're familiar with in spherical coordinates. And in addition, I have two more coordinates, x super 2, which is the angle from the positive x-axis that varies from 0 to 2 pi, and x super 3, which is the angle from the positive z-axis or the positive vertical axis. Again, suppose I have a three-dimensional curve gamma defined using these parametric equations of x super 1, x super 2, and x super 3 in terms of some parameter t. The arc length gamma can be found by zooming in again on an infinitesimally small segment ds. I won't derive the expression for ds in spherical coordinates because it's of limited utility for the purposes of this video, but I'll leave it to you to show that the arc length element ds is given by the following expression in spherical coordinates. And again, if I compare this to my general metric tensor expression, I can find the components of my metric tensor. When I do that, I see that once again the cross terms are zero, which means that overall in spherical coordinates my metric tensor is given by the following expression. So I have now found and shown you the metric tensor in three different coordinate systems. So in the end, the take home message from this video is that the metric tensor tells me the geometric properties of my coordinate system or space. Specifically, I showed how we can use the metric tensor for different coordinate systems to find the arc lengths of curves in those coordinate systems. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk more about the metric tensor and some neat properties it has. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.